biggest problem is, the biggest problem in team productivity comes usually down to communication. That if the leaders buy in and the leaders are doing it, then it, it trickles down. Once you're very clear on what it is you want to achieve, then the how becomes much easier. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to uh, this week's edition of Loop Email uh, Podcast. Today we'll be talking about team productivity. I'm very happy that I can uh, say hello to uh, Carl Pruin. Carl is a well-known uh, productivity expert. Uh, you coach around the world around uh, team uh, productivity and time management, and you've been uh, working with many teams worldwide, helping them uh, get uh, uh, their stuff done quicker, faster, and uh, better. Uh, and my understanding is you live in Korea. Hi. I do. Uh, <laughs> Hello, and thank you for question. inviting me. <laughs> the simple question first, uh, uh, why Korea? Yeah, beer is very cheap. And, and actually, uh, the funny story there, there is a story. Uh, I'd actually studied law and then practiced law for about two years. So in total, six years, and it was... During the day, I was working at law. At uh, night time, I was studying law, and I just needed a break. And I looked around Asia because I thought that's far away from the Europe, Europe, totally different culture. <laughs> and it came down to Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, or China. And I don't know what it was, but I just saw the beer prices, and I don't know how I did that. And I thought, okay, definitely South Korea, because it was less than a pound a pint. Wow, that's, that's uh, much cheaper than uh, England, I know that. <laughs> it is, yes. <laughs> so, uh, talking about um, team productivity, give me, um, you know, let's, let's, let's uh, talk about your experiences uh, while working uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, what's, what's the typical time, type of uh, team uh, you encounter? And when somebody comes to you and asks you for advice around team management, What's the problem he's really trying to solve? What is the theme he's, he's, he's looking to solve? What is he looking for? I think a lot of it is actually, is quite individual, but most of the problems I've come across is, although they're not aware of it, it's the way they're communicating their outcome. I'm all about the outcome. Uh, the tiny details to me are actually less important than what is the actual outcome. And the biggest problem I find is that Leaders and senior managers are not communicating the outcome clearly enough because we have many different types of people in each team. We have, um, you know, the way that we understand things is kind of different. We've got visual learners, we've got auditory learners, uh, kinesthetic learners, and they all need that message communicating in maybe a slightly different way. But the manager or the leader generally communicates in their preferred style. Some get it, some don't. Some need clarification. And then we have other problems where they're too shy to ask for clarification. They don't want to look stupid. So it, when you break it down and you look at where the biggest problem is, the biggest problem in team productivity comes usually down to communication. And so how do you, uh, if, if, if communication is the number one problem, but people sort of don't really understand that maybe that's where uh, the problem is, how do you sort of get them from how they, you know, start talking with you and, and them figuring out that, it's, you know, they're, you're right and the communication is, is, is the thing they should be solving. Is, that a, is there a process there? Is there a, uh, there, a, well, there is one uh, little trick that I do. <laughs> there is one little trick I do, and I, I become very annoying because I start asking the question, what's the outcome? What's the outcome? What's the outcome? Almost everything they say, well, I'm trying to do this, and says, well, what's the outcome here? What do you want? What's the end result? What will make you happy? And, you know, after a few sessions of that, they get it. Because then they start thinking in terms of, okay, this is the outcome. I, you know, I work with a lot of pharmaceutical companies, for example. And if you're working with, like, the, um, the department, they would call it, is um, market access, which generally means they have to get approval from the government first. And, you know, they're, they're saying, oh, we're going to do this, we've got to do this, and we've got to do this. So, okay, okay, stop, stop, stop. What's the outcome here? We'll get approval. Okay, well, how's that, you know, focusing there, how's that going to get the approval? Well, that's what we've always done. And then, <laughs> <laughs> then we start looking at the process of doing it and saying, well, why are you doing that? You did that 10 years ago. The government has changed their process now. 
So why are you doing this document? Why, and you know, we start going, but when we start with that in first question, what's the outcome? What do you really want to get achieved here? Then we can get down to where the problems usually uh, come. And it's following old processes. It's not being aware of how the, um, the market might have changed. Um, you know, I, I know from my own experience with social media, you know, social media marketing, it changes every month. <laughs> you know, if, you're, if I'm doing what I was doing in February, it would just feel dated already. <laughs> it's just that's okay. and, and and tell me with uh, you know by by um, working in so many different countries and so many different industries, do you see a pattern there? Is, is, you know, is is an industry versus industry? Are there pa are, is it always the same pattern for you? Uh, are you just solving sort of going through the the same uh, uh, pattern of solving problems, or or do you see you know something happening in Korea that's very different to if you were. Uh, handling something in France or in Europe or in the, in the States? Well, in, uh, in, in Korea, actually it's not Korea, it's particularly, it's Asia in general, uh, harmony is very important. Harmony within a team is very important. Now, a classic example, and I have no insider knowledge of this, but I can guess what happened with the Samsung Galaxy Fold phone, mm -hmm. you know, the foldable, bendable <laughs> phone. Um, I can guess what happened there is that somebody lower down the hierarchical ladder knew that it wasn't good enough but instead of upsetting anybody instead of wanting to upset anybody, they didn't say anything now uh -huh. this this can, and you know you'll have probably had a leader in the team who's saying this has got to be uh, sent out to all the media on such and such a date so you know somebody knew that that phone was not good enough to go to the press but they didn't call it out because in Asian cultures, harmony is very, very important. They didn't want to upset anybody. They didn't want to, as we say, tread on anyone's toes. Um, and the beauty of Samsung, for example, is they learn very quickly from their mistakes. I, they've done that many times and they learn fast. So uh, it's not disrespectful to Samsung. I can guess what happened. I have no idea if it was that, but uh, that's an Asian thing. Harmony is very important. And most of the time that works very well. Um, I remember when I first came over to Korea and I was watching construction workers building apartment complexes, not huge ones, just maybe three or four floor apartment complex. You know, I would come into work in the morning when I was teaching English in my first few years here and the building was standing. By the time I finished at around three, four o'clock in the afternoon, it was gone. <laughs> it was just a blank space. Now, how did they do that? You know, the teamwork in Korea is unbelievable. But ultimately sometimes it when you when you need that hard decision making when somebody needs to call something out that's where the weaknesses come in so taking taking that uh, harmony thing uh, uh, it's interesting i i i actually uh, you know i i fully embrace that word harmony and, and and having harmony but how do you sort of confront harmony or uh, uh you know the, the when you change there's conflict there is um uh, there, there's this, this need to change brings this harmony into, into the equation. So how does harmony uh, and, and change come together? Well, in this particular, I mean, in that particular case, then the leader has to understand that they have different diverse people in their teams. We always do. Um, you're not going to have clones working for you. Everyone's <laughs> going to be different. And a leader has to be able to understand their team so that they can sell the benefit of the change. And I use the word sell yeah. advisedly a little bit here, but if they, what I find a lot of companies do is saying, we're changing for the benefit of the company. Now, <sighs> employees don't get that. I mean, we like to think our employees love the company and they will do everything for the company, but we are individual people. We have our own interests and you know hobbies and things you need to understand it from the employee or the team member's perspective and the benefit you need to be able to tell them this is going to benefit you by and then whatever the reason is and it takes a bit more thought but i do find a lot of companies say oh this is going to be great for the company we're going to be able to grow better we're going to be more streamlined we'll make better decisions but the employee is thinking yeah yeah more training courses more meetings you know they're not excited about it so you need to be able to understand the benefit to the employee or to the team member if you're making changes. Um, okay. 
Thank you. Uh, let's focus now on sort of, uh, you know, your, your typical engagement. And, and I, I always sort of ask, for me, the number one question is, uh, you, you understand what the outcome is, you understand where you want to get uh, a specific team. But what's the really first step you do within the first day and the first, you know, week, once you sort of get into uh, an engagement uh, with, with a client? What's, what's the most important thing you have to do within the first, uh, uh, you know, within the first few days uh, of, of, of engagement? What's that? that <laughs> Look at their calendars. Look at their calendars. I want to know how many meetings they're having. That tells me everything I really need to know. Um, because first of all, what I find in most companies that are really struggling on the productivity, and I, I have one client at the moment that's implementing a global initiative. It's a global company. They're implementing a global initiative right now. They've been trying to implement it for four years and they only have less than 200 employees. This should never have taken four years, but they've had so many meetings and oh, and you can again. I actually, when the the actual HR director said, "I'm the one in charge of this now," I said, "Okay, well, well what's the outcome here? What are you trying to achieve?" And she, even she wasn't very clear on what exactly. I thought, right, here's where the biggest problem is. But you can tell a lot of the problems by the number of meetings uh, a department or a company is having about a particular project. Because if there's a lot of meetings that means that the outcome hasn't been expressed clearly enough. Uh, the team are not sure what they're supposed to be doing because they're always having to have meetings to clarify. Um, and that's the big, that's where you can find. So the two things I would need to do initially is first look at people's calendars and then attend a meeting. Cause I can usually tell then that the meetings are just talking shops and the worst kind of meeting, the update meeting, where everybody gets into a room and for 45 minutes they're having a chat about what work they're doing and then there's no outcome. You know, there's no next actions. Um, you know, this is the, like the symptoms of where you can see productivity not very good in a company. And, and after you get this analysis done, what, what sort of, how do you get a, a new behavior uh, started? You know, the, the, getting off of meetings is sort of a, it's, it's a, it's a behavior model of how to solve uh, problems. And, and I totally agree with you that uh, meetings are, are where, uh, where the cause of many, uh, much friction is, but how do you then sort of instill a new behavior? How do you sort of get them from having this amount of meetings to, you know, more effective, uh, better meetings? What's the process there? What's the concrete process? Well, one of the first things I do is usually start advising people to, uh, maximum time for a meeting is 30 minutes. Now, a fundamental change happens when you change it to 30 minutes maximum. First of all, there's no small talk. <laughs> Secondly, I notice people are not late. If it's an hour long meeting, people think, ah, it won't matter if I'm two or three minutes late or five minutes late, because they'll just be talking anyway. Um, but when it's a 30 minute meeting, that really sharpens up the meetings. And also, the other thing I usually make sure they're doing, because another thing they're usually not doing is sending out any kind of agenda. So another rule that you have to impose is whoever calls the meeting has to send an agenda 48 hours before the meeting, because that, may, that forces them to think about what they want to accomplish in the meeting. But that is just one of the simple things you can do within a company to immediately see some improvement in their productivity because everything sharpens up they have to express their opinion and move on what's the next you know what's the next action what do we have to do to move this forward you know those kind of questions they're sharp they're direct and they they get action moving and and the other ones is like who's responsible for this of course as well and 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 what you tend to see is this sort of that change happens in, in a week a month what's your typical uh, you know, first of all, what's your typical team size you operate with? Oh, it can vary. I mean, um, you know, sometimes it can be like I'm working with the, the, the general manager or the country lead or the country head. And that could be like we're leading 60, 70, even 100, more than 100 people. But quite often it's just within the a manager is having really big difficulty. It could be six to eight team members. 
Okay. And again, it's the same process. You're looking at, first of all, how many meetings are they having? That tells you pretty much everything you need to know. And another question you can ask is how many of those meetings are overrunning? So if the meeting is scheduled from, say, 11.30 to 12.30, does it really finish at 12.30? Or does it often run to 12.45? How many meetings finish early? Because there's another sign. If meetings, if companies have got meetings that finish early, that's a sign they're a sharp company. So there's, meetings is, is a great way of knowing uh, whether a company is really focused on the outcomes and focused on their projects. And, and when you sort of are in these kinds of engagements, how important is, is sort of the, um, you know, the team spirit, the team dynamics, how much, how much is it actually getting the discipline of having the agenda, getting people uh, uh, to focus on the outcome, getting people to uh, uh, talk about, uh, you know, the stuff that matters, and how much is it about sort of getting the dynamics of the team uh, uh, in order? Is that something that's in your, uh, you know, do you see that an important part of your uh, uh, engagement or do you feel those things then actually solve themselves out once the first part is solved? Well, actually, the, the key to success with these changes is leadership buy-in. If the leaders are not buying into it, if the leaders don't even talk to me, I know it's not going to work because... It's a lesson I learned when I, when I first started my employment life, my employed life. I worked in a car company. Uh, we were selling cars. The general manager there, um, this was in the early 90s, or yeah, early 90s. So we didn't have the digital technology we have today, and we didn't have email or anything like that. He used to carry around an, an A4 leather-bound diary. It was gorgeous. Whenever he had a meeting, he'd also have a, a reporter's notebook. And if he asked somebody to do something, he would write it down. And the person who saw him writing it down, three or four days later, he would do like a walk around and he would say, how are you getting on with that task I gave you? And what I noticed, and this, I was in my early 20s at this stage, and I, what I noticed was, wow, everybody was so sharp because they knew he was going to come around and ask you within a few days, how are you getting on with that task I gave you? So I, I learned right then that if the leaders buy in and the leaders are doing it, then it, it trickles down because it sharpens everybody up because you know the boss is going to come and get you. And going even further back, when I was 16 years old, my first job working as a part-time, working part-time in a hotel, the general manager of the hotel used to come in every morning and he'd walk down the corridor with his finger on the banister <clears throat> looking for dust. And the housekeeper, the cleaners, saw him do this every morning. I guarantee he never found any dust because they <laughs> very quickly learned he was checking, he was following up, and he was keeping to making sure the standards were high. And everyone knew the standards of the hotel. So when the leaders buy in, it trickles down. And if you, if you sort of, you know, we've, we've gone through that process and uh, what happens and how do you see sort of then success? What's, what's the definition of success? You've, you've got this engagement, you've got people to sort of start focusing on the outcomes, you've got people starting to have efficient meetings, talking about important stuff, uh, following up uh, uh, the, the basics. You know, if, if you come back into that kind of an uh, uh, environment uh, six months later, what do you see? Uh, that has changed what is you know what are the most profound things you've seen uh, uh that, that have changed for these people uh, uh but when companies are successful with this what i do find is they are for his first of all holding less meetings even though i reduce the time <laughs> they're actually holding less meetings because they're communicating better the the, the messages and the, what they have to do is being clearly communicated to the staff and the the, the other thing you'll notice if you walk in immediately, it's so much quieter because people are actually getting on with the work that they weren't able to do before because they were having to attend meetings or other people were interrupting them. But now they have very clear instructions. They know exactly what needs to be done. They know the milestones. They know the deadlines. And the office will be immediately quieter. You can tell when you walk in. You think, oh, it's working just from the sound. Interesting. And, and do you ever, does any of your clients ever actually have a 
quantifiable, not just, you know, a quantifiable goal in terms of 30% uh, less meetings, uh, whatever productivity KPI they're looking at, is, you know, is, is, is the outcome actually something that gets measured or is it something like you said, which is, you know, everything is quieter, people feel more relaxed because they're doing stuff they should be doing and they're not being constantly micromanaged. So, it, you know, is the outcome on the hard fact measurable or, or, or part of it or is well, it? I pers yeah, I personally don't suggest any KPIs because every company is going to be different. You know, some companies are measuring, you know, revenue per employee and, you know, as a, as a productivity metric. Uh, you know, I'm, I've always think, well, that's really for machines and humans are not machines. So, but you know, some companies like to measure it that way. And that's usually coming from the global head office. And so I'm not going to get involved in that argument, but there are things like you can compare by right, the number of projects that don't need to extend the deadline because usually when I get called in it's because they're frequently having to extend deadlines on projects. Um, they're missing milest key milestone dates. And so that's when you can actually measure whether you've had a significant change because suddenly you're not getting, you're not having to extend deadlines to, for projects. Your milestones are being hit actually early, hmm. which is because for some reason, milestones always seem to come up on a Friday. So I, I sort of, when I'm working individually with somebody, I say, make sure you're finished by Thursday. Because if I can get them to be focused on finishing the day before, you know, Friday is party day. <laughs> All the work's done. And that helps to build that camaraderie, builds that, you know, that, that more relaxed atmosphere. Uh, one question about sort of uh, uh, a little bit more generic is, 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 is going back to sort of the in, individual productivity versus team productivity. You know, if, if there's one, one liner in, in, in your learnings up to now is, where do, you say, where do you think it begins? Does it always begin with the team and the leader and how he gets the team working? Or is it sometimes getting the leader in order and, and then sort of getting the team in order in, in, in that sequence? What's, what's, where, where, do you, where do you really uh, start the story? Well, essentially what I want, uh, if I'm starting with a new client, I really want to know what does the leader want? Okay. You know, how is the leader going to measure success in what I've been asked to do because every leader is going to be different. Everyone wants a slightly different uh, outcome. <laughs> it goes back to that word outcome. If I'm working with individual people, which I do a lot of uh, coaching with individual people on productivity. Um, again, it does come back to that question. As I say, it becomes very annoying, but what's the outcome you want to achieve here? Because if you don't know that you, you probably end up going round and round in circles. Mm -hmm. But once you're very clear, on what it is you want to achieve, whether you want to become a millionaire, it's like goal setting really. Once you're very clear on what it is you want to achieve, then the how becomes much easier. And yeah. so you can't really move to the, how are we gonna do this until we know what, what exactly it is they want to achieve. Um, there are other things with, on a more personal level, it's on a one-to-one -one, uh, with an individual, the why also is very important. But on a company level, the why tends to move more towards their mission statement. Why are they in business? But on an individual basis, why do you want to be a millionaire? Or you know, why do you want to start your own business? You know, those, that question is very important. But from team-based productivity, it always comes back to what is it that you really want to achieve here? What's the outcome you want? And from there, we can figure out the how. So, so, you know, it's, we started with the, the what, we've ended with the what, and, and, and actually, you know, my, my, my podcasts normally finish off by asking, uh, you know, what is it about you? What is, you know, your story? What is, what is your why in the world? What's your outcome in the world? Why, do you, you know, what's the things that make you tick and what's the stuff you like to do and create and, and, and do, you know, regardless of it's your, your personal life, your business life, but what is, what's your outcome? What's, what's the stuff you actually thrive on? And where is that special moment where you, you come back and you say, uh, uh, you know, this is it. You've got the cheap beer, you've got a process, you've got all the <laughs> successful teams and all that, but where is it, where is the little thing, you know, that we all have uh, that, that makes it special for you and what is that 
uh, thing you're looking for? For me, it was actually, it's a little bit of my backstory. As I said before, I trained as a lawyer. I, my intention was to become a lawyer. I thought, hey, that's a cool thing to do. Um, but after six years of studying it and then working it, I just needed that break. But this was at the end of my 20s. And I, when I came to Korea and I started teaching, I went, oh my God, this is what I love. I love teaching. It was completely random. I never expected it. But once I, so the, the end of my first year, the, the Language Institute said, do you want to renew your contract? And I go, mm, okay. Uh, second year, mm, okay. By the end of the third year, I thought, I'm not going to go back. I, could, I just knew. I was just so loving teaching. The productivity side, though, came in, started with me when I was probably a teenager. You know, I, used to, I used to draw out on pieces of paper uh, when we had exams, my revision timetable. And I was brilliant at making these charts because we didn't have Excel or anything then. It was just pen and paper, pencil and pen and a ruler. And I, oh, it was beautiful. And I loved doing it. I was terrible at doing the revision, but oh, I was great at making a schedule. Um, and I, I discovered like productivity books and those time management books. And I just read every single one I could get. So I've been fascinated by it since middle school but um so it's a, it's one of those weird things it's like the connection suddenly happened when i was about 31 teaching and productivity bring the two together and i'm in heaven and and it helps careers beer is very cheap and <laughs> <laughs> it does help <laughs> uh, carl it was uh, it was uh, really an unbelievable experience uh, talking with you uh, i will uh, i will uh, Remember uh, uh, very much, uh, you know, what's a good selection criteria when you try to figure out which country to go to, the, the, yep. the price of beer, uh, uh, the question that always should be on every manager's uh, mind, which is sort of, uh, you know, what's the outcome and forget everything until you uh, agree on what the outcome is, and then mm -hmm. work hard on reducing the number of, 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 of meetings by being focused on, on the outcome and then uh, agreeing what to do. Uh, so it was a really, I think, valuable, valuable uh, discussion, not for the two of us, but for everybody listening. And, and that's why it's so important to also understand where can our listeners and, and viewers actually connect with you? Uh, well, did they oh, you can you? connect with me through my website. It's carlpauline.com. Uh, all my contact details are there, Facebook, Twitter, um, um, Instagram, <laughs> it's all there. Um, but so is all my uh, YouTube channel where I put up videos out every week. I, I also have a podcast that comes out every Monday morning, Korean time, so Sunday night <laughs> for most everybody else. Uh, I write a blog every week, so <clears throat> it's all on my website, so carlpauline.com. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, an unbelievable experience. Uh, thank you to our viewers. We've been listening to Carl, uh, the meeting expert uh, working in uh, Korea, but working with companies all over the world. Thank you again. Uh, it was an unbelievable uh, 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 exchange and, and hopefully we'll meet somewhere in the future. Yep. Thank you, Carl. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you for you the invitation. Bye-bye.